Thank you very much. I have to live up to that introduction. <laughs> um, my, I have a, it's a, I'm going to talk uh, certainly to show, to try to prove a thesis. And uh, the thesis uh, that we try to, if not prove, at least support, is the notion that contrary to many liberal and left, and some left interpretations of the Cuban Revolution, the leaders of the Cuban Revolution did make choices. Uh, even though, of course, they were working under constraints, the constraint of U.S. imperialism, the constraint of a semi-developed uh, economy, and so on. But nonetheless, they made choices. And the choice included going the road of the socialism from above, Soviet-type society that still exists in the island. To understand why this happened uh, and how it happened, uh, it's necessary to look at the transition from political to social revolution that took place before and after 59. Essentially, the transition took place in 1959, uh, including uh, the internal factors that allowed that revolution to take the, the, the road it took, and also the fact that it sprung a surprise on US imperialism. I think it's a very important element of this that US imperialism did not expect the developments that took place, and that gave a tremendous advantage uh, to the leadership. Uh, when I talk about political revolution in Cuba, I'm talking about the developments until January 1st, 59, which is the day in which in the day that Batista was overthrown. Uh, it was a political revolution because it was fighting for a change in the political regime. Uh, it specifically, it was fighting for the restoration of the 1940 constitution a fairly progressive constitution, I may add, and the, and the restoration of political democracy. It is only after victory, and I want to underline that, it's only after victory that this political revolution became a social revolution, by which I mean uh, a change in class relations, a change in the class system and the power relations that go along with that. Uh, the main, the keystone of that uh, change into social revolution was the agrarian reform that was legislated in May of 1959, and which included, of course, the essentially, although it wasn't called that, it was essentially the confiscation of foreign property, foreign landed property, particularly United States uh, property, landed property. Uh, at this point, Cuba then became the third social revolution in Latin America of the 20th century after Mexico in the period from 1910 to 1940 and Bolivia in 1952. Now, there is nothing unusual about a political revolution leading eventually to a social revolution. That, in fact, right, not only is not unusual, it's the rule. What I believe is peculiar to the Cuban case, and I will ex try to explain why, is that the elements of social revolution that are always latent in any political revolution were particularly buried under the surface. They were much more profoundly buried, they were much more uh, far from the surface than would have been the case, say, in Mexico or in Bolivia. Um, so the potential elements of social revolution were much more deeply buried in Cuba for reasons that, uh, that I will describe now. Uh, Anti-imperialism, for example, had, had virtually disappeared from the political scene in Cuba uh, in the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, interestingly, Fidel Castro has spoken about that on various occasions. He spoke about that fact that imperial, anti-imperialism had disappeared from Cuban politics in the 40s and 50s. He spoke about that when he was in Chile visiting Allende in the 70s, and again, much more recently, when uh, he celebrated the, the 50th anniversary of his entering the University of Havana Law School in 1945. This was in 1995. He brought up the same theme all over again. So you had a situation where anti-imperialism had essentially had disappeared from the, uh, the political scene in Cuba, including the militant youth at the University of Havana. That's why Castro brought it up at this anniversary of his entering the University of Havana. Uh, it is true that people spoke in very big terms about agrarian reform. In fact, everybody spoke. That was the issue. That was the problem. Everybody spoke about agrarian reform, including the land, the, 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 the landowners. 
but of course, that agrarian reform has become uh, meaningless. Essentially, that lip service to agrarian reform has become meaningless because it only really referred, when you ask people in those days, to distributing idle lands, that is, lands that were not in production. Uh, for, furthermore, the generally progressive 1940 Constitution, when it came to the issue of seizing land for the purpose of the agrarian reform, made it, made it very clear made it very clear that compensation had to be paid in cash for any land that was seized. This is, this is actually Article 24 of the 1940 Constitution in Cuba. Interesting enough, in the generally radical uh, document, history will absolve it, that Castro uh, wrote in 1953, which by the way, he was forgotten about after 1956, in the period where he was trying to make a very broad coalition in Cuba, but in history will have only was a radical document. Uh, he didn't talk too much about the issue of compensation, which to me was the key question of dividing a radical position, agrarian reform, from a, a, a moderate conservative position. And he spoke something about the fact that uh, compensation would be based on the income of the last 10 years that the landlords had had. So he too avoided the issue that the communists had been very clear back in 1940 when they said that no, comp no cash compensation was required. They lost. So the lip service to agrarian reform uh, uh, was just that, lip service. Uh, so what I'm trying to convey to you is a climate where uh, even the terms left was no use except by the communists. And the communists, I'm, I'm talking here, was a very small sectarian group that although significant by Latin American standards was not, and I repeat, was not a mass party in any shape or form. Uh, so what are the reasons for this? And the reasons for this, to summarize it and, and obviously to be brief, is number one, the Cold War, which had a very serious impact on Cuba, uh, including the purging of the unions, just like happened in the United States. Uh, yeah, but beyond the the, the Cold War, there was also the decay of the 1933 revolution, that is the radicalization that had been very explicitly anti-imperialist in 1933, all of that had decayed. Uh, and in part this decay of the anti-imperialism of the, of the 33 revolution, uh, it had decayed because there was a period of relative prosperity with World War II and the Korean War when the price of sugar went to incredible heights. So a combination of the Cold War and the, and the effect of the relative prosperity in Cuba contributed to marginalize radical ideas and to very deeply uh, bury them in the popular consciousness. More so, I would claim, than had been the case uh, in Mexico and Bolivia before uh, the revolution. Um, then comes the victory of January 1st, 59. And that victory opened up uh, new business. You know, uh, the Cuban people felt to use a saying of, that became popular many, many decades later. They, be, they, they thought that another world was possible indeed. Mm -hmm. And there was a great deal of, uh, a, a great deal of effervescence and demands and strikes. Um, and of course, the beginning of the development of anti-imperialism in Cuba not out of any socioeconomic demands at this point, but because the American media and Congress made a tremendous scandal about the executions of Batistianos that had taken place in Cuba. That, quite justifiably and correctly, created a great deal of resentment in Cuba when the American media had expressed very little in, uh, concern with the murders of Batista, and all of a sudden they were up in arms about the executions. That, cre that be began to uh, resurrect, if you will, the imperialism uh, the anti-imperialism that had existed uh, in Cuba in the 1930s and even until the early 40s, but had then since then disappeared. Now, this uh, effervescence, this expectation, this sense that things now and politicization that took place was, however, at a very low level of political consciousness at a very low level, and by that I don't mean uh, uh, knowing Marxism or anything of the sort. What I mean by that is that a lot of the demands that took place, and Fidel Castro pointed it out, took place at a level of militant reformism, at the level of militant union demands. 
not on anything, not only social, but on anything that could be systemic in, it is, in its expression. And Fidel Castro was the first uh, to point that out. Now, the question is, what is the solution to that? And here we begin to see the elements of the development of what I would call a social, socialism from above perspective in Cuba. Uh, in, both in February and April, an editorialist revolution, which was the uh, newspaper of the 26th of July movement, uh, argued, uh, Marcelo Fernandez was his name, he argued that for the necessity of forming a rank and file democratic organization, not this formless movement that had been the 26th of July movement, but a much more articulated and organized group that would be a democratic organization. And this, keep in mind that this proposal was made at the time that would not have included the, the old communists. Hmm. You see, this is very important to, to point this out. This proposal in favor of April 59, for reasons I cannot go into now, would have automatically excluded the participation of the old communists. It would have included all the various elements in the 26th July movement. Fidel Castro ignored uh, this proposal by the uh, uh, by the editorialist of Revolución. And instead of that, he adopted a different tactic. Instead of that, he adopted the tactic, or perhaps even the strategy, perhaps it's more appropriate, to essentially uh, use his incredible popular prestige, which is half and popularity, but more than popularity, you know, tremendous prestige that Fidel Castro had, to essentially present revolutionary legislation as a fake accompli to the mass of the population and then get its, its, its support. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's no better example of that than the agrarian reform legislation that was eventually approved uh, in May of 59. And this is a very interesting case study because that legislation that was eventually approved in May 59, nobody knew what it was going to be. So much so that even the most conservative element would say, we are also for agrarian reform here, Fidel, and this is what we, what we would like you to do about it. And of course, what they were proposing would have been no reform at all. It would have been just preserving their privileges and power. But the point is that the vagueness of this notion of air reform opened room for everybody proposing their favorite, uh, their favorite agrarian reform legislation that would obviously protect their interests. Eventually, May 59, uh, after a long reunion of the, of the, the, the leadership cadre, uh, a law was finally put forward, which was a radical law, uh, which was a radical law. But it was after the fact that uh, Castro, uh, Fidel Castro uh, rallied the troops behind him. So instead of following the suggestion of the Detroit Revolution, let's have a rank and file democratic, essentially a party, he didn't use that word, but that's what I would mean. And a party means a political program. And a political program means that there, there are certain guidelines about what is it that people want. Instead of that, it was, the tactic was, uh, let's present fair complete and then rally people be, uh, uh, around that fair complete. Um, and this, and the reason for this was not just because it was a way of preserving his personal control of the movement that was part of it, but also, and this is also very important in my opinion, a way of delaying the reaction of the opposition, both internally as well as externally. The United States still thought that, you know, they are testimonies by CIA people and so on in Congress saying, no, we don't think us is a communist, all that stuff, you know, that, that, there's a lot of examples of that. So this tactic was not only a way of uh, keeping personal control, but also trying to uh, keep the opposition and how particularly the opposition of U.S. imperialism delayed as much as possible. And one way of delaying as much as possible was by not revealing the full program until absolutely the last minute. Of course, uh, there's no doubt that that was effective vis-a-vis -vis the opposition of the right, both internally and externally, but in the process that also has a price in terms of building the consciousness of your base because the consciousness we are building is that of followers rather than of subjects, rather than that is people continue to be the objects of history rather than the subjects of history. So that tactic had uh, a tremendous price. Now, why was this radicalism represented by the agrarian reform possible? 
because I, you know, I haven't explained that. How was that radicalism pushed by the leadership and then supported and authentically supported? I don't mean to say that support was fake. No, the support is authentic, but it tended to be after the fact. Why was it possible to push uh, in such a radical fashion? Number one, the total, complete collapse of the army, of the traditional army in Cuba. And that, the, the collapse was so total that I don't think, and, I, I, and I, in my last book I give evidence for that, that the revolutionary leadership itself expected that to happen. That even they were taken aback by the, the amount of power that they ended up with their hands. That is, the, the, the old traditional mercenary army just collapsed. Uh, there was also, in addition to that, and that of course, you know, the, the, the destruction of the traditional army, in the case of Mexico, in the case of Bolivia, is absolutely essential to the possibility of a radical social revolution. But not only was the army collapsed, but it was also a total discredit of the traditional political parties, including the opposition parties. That is, the, the parties that had consistently opposed Batista, but uh, but were not in the 26th July movement, they were other political forces, they completely collapsed. Uh, moreover, the institutions of what many years later was called civil society, including those institutions of civil society that had strongly supported Fidel Castro's 26th July movement, also were either, uh, were either very weak or simply dissolved themselves. For example, the movement of civic resistance which had been the principal organization, Movimiento Resistencia Cívica, which had been the principal movement organizing the civilian opposition in the city, which is, in, by the way, in terms of numbers, in terms of numbers of far, far more important than the couple of thousand rebels in the hills of Eastern Cuba. Many more people were involved in the underground in the cities than, uh, than, in the, than with the rebels in the Sierra Maestra and later uh, in central Cuba. The movement of civic resistance dissolved itself into the 20th century of July movement in late February of 1959. Uh, um, so you have this total collapse of the traditional structures and the having discarded the formation of a new organization that would be a rank and file democratic organization had, as had been proposed by the editorials of revolution, then the, the road became open uh, for the choice that was eventually made to this structure from above, uh, the Cuban version of the, of the Soviet system. Uh, that was not inevitable because there was, as I said before, this effervescence, this politically pluralist and radical, although not highly developed politically, movement that did exist from below in the first nine months or so of, of, uh, of 1959. Uh, it was in the late summer, and this is an argument I make also in my last book, it is in the late summer of 59, from January 1st to the late summer, that a decision was made uh, in the part of Fidel Castro and the people close to him to ally with the USSR externally and with the old communists at home. That is, the old communists at home and the uh, USSR external. They are not exactly the same thing. Of course, the old communists at home and the USSR were allies. They were, you know, the old communists at home were the, the, the local branch, the local franchise of, the, of, the, of Moscow. Nonetheless, uh, we can explore this in the discussion later, there were some uh, conflicts of interest uh, between those two groups. But that decision, uh, I'm pretty certain, not certain, but I, I, I'm fairly convinced, I would say, I think that's a more accurate way of saying it, uh, it was made in the late summer to align with the USSR external with the old communists at home. And, that, and this had consequences. For example, um, there had been, for many, many years, the, there had been these black voluntary associations uh, called Sociedades de Color, the colored societies, which had been the, essentially, even though many blacks supported the old communists, Certainly, they supported more the old communists than any other single political group. Uh, however, the principal organ of defense of black interest in Cuba was La Sociedad de Color. By the mid-60s, they were all shut down. That is, as an independent organization, they were dissolved. 
uh, there's an article, if you're interested, by Juan René Betancourt, which was the, pro the most prominent black leader in Cuba uh, in that period, and was, in fact, the guy who had been put in charge as a revolution, the representative of the revolution in the color societies. In, he wrote an article that, that detailing this experience with the government trying to shut them down, and eventually they did. And in the magazine Crisis, which is, of course, the magazine the end of the NAACP, in 1961. You might, if you're interested in this, I recommend that article. Crisis 1961, Juan René Betancourt. So these organizations have been all disappeared. And to this day, although the, the discussion of racism in Cuba in the last couple of years has opened up a, a fair amount, and we'll I'll talk about that uh, the discussion tomorrow, nonetheless, there's still, to this day, no independent organization in defense of black people in Cuba. Uh, so they had essentially been dissolved. So were women's organizations in Cuba. They were all dissolved, and then the official state federation, uh, Cuban Federation of Women, was created in 1960. That's consistent with what was done with the black society. Even more dramatic was the example of the unions, because what happened in the unions was a tremendous effervescence and mobilization. I think that's the right word of the unions in Cuba, in which they not only threw out all the uh, Batistianos who have been essentially controlling the unions on behalf of the Batista government, but essentially they held new elections. Every single local union in Cuba held elections from the spring of 59, uh, the spring and summer of 59, every single one of them. And the 26th of the movement overwhelmingly won the elections. The, the, the communists only got about 10% of the union post. Uh, a result that is very consistent with an internal survey the old Cuban Communist Party conducted in 1956 that found that only 15% of the unions were led by their people or people friendly to them. So the, the survey of the old Cuban Communists in 1956 and the outcome of the elections in 1959 were incredibly consistent. Uh, so so uh, a Congress was to be held in November of 59 to, uh, to finally elect the national leadership that came out of all these elections in the local and regional bodies of the union. Uh, it, it, it was certain that at that Congress, uh, a non-communist leadership, meaning non, not the all Cuban communist leadership would be elected, Castro personally intervened to make sure that people who were friendly to the communists, although not yet the communists themselves, would be elected to the controlling positions of the union. And this created a tremendous uh, crisis at that Congress. But already you can see with the actions, with the black organizations, with the women's organizations, with the unions, the, the choices that were being made incrementally and without disclosure. Because one thing is when I go back and research these matters and find out that as early of April 59, there were already uh, Spanish communists uh, active in the Cuban army, as was revealed in research uh, that was conducted in the Soviet Union after the collapse of the, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the archives were open and serious research was done on that. Uh, that is the outside observer or the, the, the later observer, such as myself, who can find that out. But there was no consciousness uh, in Cuba at the time because there was no disclosure of what was happening. It was an incremental process that you could tell where the wind was blowing. But it was never labeled as such until 1961 when the revolution officially became socialist. Now, um, the question, and I want to, this is the last, what I want to say, because I want to leave a, as much time as possible for discussion. The question is, uh, how do we explain why, why this politically developed uh, the way it did? And there are differing answers to that. There are differing answers to that. There's number one, the answer given by the Cuban right in South Florida, and mm -hmm. people who think, the people who think like them in, in Cuba, and also, by the way, some liberals such as Tatchuk, Tatchuk, uh, was an important, uh, S-Z-U-L-C, was a very important uh, journalist for the New York Times and, and wrote a gigantic book, which is a biography of Fidel Castro. This book appeared in 1988, I think. And 
and uh, both the Cuban right and that troop maintained that what happens was there was a plot, there was a conspiracy. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of that joke, the conspiracy went back to 1958, before victory. I say that joke argues in his book on Fidel Castro that before the victory of the revolution, there was already a pact between the old communists and, and, uh, and Fidel Castro to take you in a, in a Soviet direction. Uh, and of course, that jokes, uh, not only he's not a professional historian, I, I am not one who has a point of view that only people who have an academic certificate are entitled to research things. I don't believe in that at all. Uh, but there is something about a historical training that uh, can be helpful that people can acquire without getting a PhD, by the way. But obviously, uh, there, there a lot of evidence uh, that, that exists pointing to the contrary that you know, we can explore if you want to in the discussion. But that's the point of view, it's all a conspiracy, it's all a plot. Uh, then there is the liberal and some of the left uh, uh, view of this, and that is that the development of Cuba in this Soviet-style direction was merely a reaction to U.S. foreign policy. It's not question about the fact they're absolutely correct when they say that U.S. imperialism, once they realized what was going on, and it took them, took them a while, by the way, uh, once they realized what was going on, they went out to smash it. And they did that through terrorism, through invasions, through, you know, you name it, you know. <laughs> you know, this, you know it's an it's a, a to Z alphabet of all the, the criminal things, and of course the continual criminal uh, economic blockade of you. Um, but this view of things, and for, I'll give you, you know, one, one example of that is uh, uh, Maurice Eitling and, 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 uh, and Bob Shear wrote a book in, 19, in the early 60s called Cuba Tragedy in the Hemisphere, and they, they, they put forward a point of view that it was U.S. foreign policy, period, that created this phenomenon. Now, one of the implications of this analysis, which I've been trying to argue against, uh, because I think it fools people. I'm not saying that Zeitlin and Scheer were deliberately intended to fool people. I, 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 I am not inside their heads. I have no idea why they have that version. I may have interpretations of that, but, I, but frankly, I don't, I, I don't know the real story there. But essentially, implied in this approach is an approach that see the, that see the Cuban leaders as blank slates. That is, that people have no ideas. They have no politics. All they are is reactive U.S. foreign policy, and that have, you know. And, and interesting enough, uh, it presents these people as without autonomy. That is implied in this analysis of in, that includes leftists like Zeitlin and Scheer is the fact that these people have no autonomy, that they are merely reactive agents, and I believe uh, that's a mistaken uh, view of what happened in Cuba. Uh, and one of the, the things that are necessary, and this is, will be the last part of my talk, uh, to understand uh, what happened in Cuba and to put, give flesh and blood and autonomy to the various actors involved in the process, is that in fact there were ideologically, there were ideological wings in this movement. Uh, in the revolutionary movement that brought about the overthrow of this, there were distinct wings. There was a liberal wing. It was a liberal wing that was fairly, very well represented in the re first revolutionary cabinet, cabinet that was installed right after the overthrow of Batista. Uh, Roberto Gramonte, Lopez Fresquet, Felipe Paso, etc. names that to you may not mean anything, but these were major figures of a liberal political bent in Cuba. These people pretty soon left of their own accord or were pushed out. Uh, it didn't take very long. Uh, for example, Jose Miro Cardona, who was the head of the Cuban Bar Association, no less, became Prime Minister of Cuba as of January 1st, 1959. By mid-February, he was gone. And Fidel Castro became the Prime Minister. So the liberal, there was a liberal wing that exited. And it is the weakness that I mentioned earlier of this civil society in Cuba, particularly middle-class civil society, which was very numerous. Cuba was, it was a fairly, it was 
I'm on the top four or five countries in Latin America in economic development. So they had a very sizable, economically speaking, middle class, not obviously by American standards, but by Latin American standards, it certainly did. At the same time, it was a very weak political middle class for all sorts of reasons. Um, so this uh, weakness of the middle class meant that those people were not even able to capitalize on the potential support that they had in the population. Because in fact, these people who either were pushed out or left of their own accord had potentially a tremendous amount of support uh, in Cuba. And if you look at Bolivia, equivalent people in Bolivia came to control the Bolivian revolutionary process with the help of US imperialism. But in Cuba, they were too weak to do what was happening in Bolivia, where they stunted the revolutionary process in Bolivia precisely because the liberals took over the, the, the process there. Then there was a radical nationalist but non-communist wing in the Cuban Revolution. One of them was this man, Marcelo Fernandez, who wrote those editorials in Revolution, saying we have to have, uh, in, in very early, very early, February and April 59, he wrote editorials in Revolution, uh, and he was part of this radical nationalist but non-communist wing. And there they were, the head of the tribunes was part of the standards, David Salvador, Faustino Perez, Enrico Tusky, Carlos Franchi, who was the editor of Revolución. And they represented, again, a state of opinion that was quite significant, but not organized. Not organized at all. Then, and here's where I think is the critical factor that explains the push towards the adoption of this uh, model, was actual political tendencies that were pushing for that. And here we come to what to what was a very important wing of the movement and turned out to be the decisive wing in the movement because keep in mind that during 59, Fidel Castro took the stance of remaining above the fray of all these conflicting tendencies. It was only later that he took very clear sides with the wing that I'm going to describe now. And this is the wing uh, of the 26th of July movement that was allied at the time with the old communists. And this is the, the wing that was led by Raul Castro and by Che Guevara. Uh, because Che Guevara became a critical of the USSR two years later. In the critical days of shaping the destiny of the Cuban Revolution, Che Guevara was an unconditional supporter of the USSR. And was, no, he was not a member of the, of the Cuban Communist Party, but he was very closely allied with them. The first people he brought us uh, to teach political ideology and, and just education, just literacy, to uh, in the Sierra Maestra and Che Guevara's group, were uh, members of the uh, Cuban Communist Party. Uh, later, in the late 60s, 61, 62, and especially 63, he developed different politics, but not in this critical period. So, uh, so there was the Raul Castro, uh, Che Guevara wing, uh, allied with the, with the old communists, uh, and, and a lot of data on, uh, on them has come out uh, on the basis of Fursenko and Naftali's book that came out in uh, called One Hell of a Gamble. This uh, Fursenko is a, is a Russian historian, Naftal is an American conservative historian. He's, he's the chief librarian in the Nixon Library, something like that. Uh, and it, the book is called One Hell of a Gamble. It's very interesting because the, the book is not primarily about this period. It's primarily about the missile crisis in 1962 and what happened there. But he has a lot of data on this earlier period, which is very useful, I think. Um, so, this group, Fidel finally, and I believe this happened, that it was not a plot that was hatched before the Victory Revolution, but the very development of the revolution led, in my opinion, in late, the late summer of 59, to Fidel Castro, Fidel Castro to, throw, to throw in his lot with this particular tendency. It was a political situation, political alignments in Cuba that was the determinant force here. And Part of the reason for the, doing that is that there was, there is reason to believe, and in my last book I, I cite the evidence on this, there is reason to believe that Raul Castro, particularly when the Fidel Castro came to the United States in April of 59, Raul Castro was ex extremely upset about it. And, uh, and by the way, Raul Castro is a man who had been a member of the youth group of the Cuban Communist Party. Uh, it's very striking though in the, his uh, political testament that he wrote in the Sierra Maestra is written on his behalf and another member 
you know, he names as his, as his, so this, his literary executor is not his brother. Is another member uh, of the Planet Central Black Movement that was close politically to him. So clearly, uh, he had a distinct political orientation that was different. Well, obviously, closely allied with his brother, but it was different from that of Lord Castro. So I think that the part of the force, part of the what was happening here, was that there was a potential split. Potential that could have happened, which would not, which would not have been unique to Cuba, because if you look at the history of third world revolutions, you find this split over and over again. You find it in Kenya. You know, when Odinga Odinga goes one way and, and the other the other Kenyatta descendants go the other way. You find it in Algeria with the overthrow of Ben Bella. So this right left split in revolutionary movement third world countries is not at all unusual. I believe there was a potential for such a split in Cuba, and I think that was one of the factors, I'm not saying it's the only one, that led Fidel to throw in his lot with that particular tendency. Of course. This happens in the context of powerful pressure. I'm spending my limited time here to show a different uh, interpretation than is usually put forward. But I am not suggesting that this was happening sort of in a vacuum. Of course, there were powerful pressures, particularly from US imperialists. But nonetheless, choices were made. So in sum, to bring this to an end, I think that the, the person who put it best was Che Guevara himself, who was always blunt, as opposed to the deviousness of Fidel and, and, and so on, F Che did not, was always blunt. And when he told the Express, the, the very influential one, then the Weekly Express, the French Weekly Express, on July 25, 63, when he was asked, I think, I believe it was Jean Daniel, was a very important reporter for the Express, how did the Cuba come about to go that particular road? In a pithy way, he said it was half the result of constraint and half the result of choice. So I will I will accept that formula of Che Guevara and bring this one in. Thank you. Okay, at this point we're going to do a QA session. Um, Eric, do you want to uh, this is incredibly interesting and I I don't really know the, these historical details that you've given, so it's all, it's always wonderful to go to a talk where you actually learn something. It's not just that you get some perspective, you actually learn something. Uh, but I have the following kind of question. At the time, in the late 50s and early 60s, was a time when the Soviet model had enormous prestige globally. And indeed, in the United States, there was genuine concern that the Soviets were going to overtake the U.S. And the view of the economic development model at that time was, the U.S. might not prevail. The, the fact that by 1989, that we see in retrospect how weak that economic model was even then, that was already beginning to stagnate, that wasn't the view at the time. I, I think CIA projections you know, were dire as to what. Mm -hmm. So if you're a, a revolutionary of good faith and you're looking for models, and you see what happens when more kind of participatory democratic things get tried and how easily they fall apart, um, either for internal or external reasons. And after all, our bends in Guatemala is not that far in the past. By the way, I wanted to know, was that, um, was that an active thing in people's consciousness in the, the, the Guatemala experience too? And it's, so in a way, I mean, this goes back to the less choice and more constraint view. I mean, the, the, the options were, trying something along a centralized, top-down, statist route, of which the Soviet model was the one in town, you know, I'm the only game in town, kind of, that's the, or being a very vulnerable to disintegration. So deciding to go with that communist route at that point in history, given what people thought they knew about alternative models, I'm not, you know, if you really were wanting to pursue a revolutionary path, I'm not sure there was a choice. I mean, you could have, it, it's a choice that you could have decided not to do a revolutionary pact. It's a choice to give up the possibility of social revolution. But at that point in history, was there a real discussion about, yes, we can have social revolution and a fundamental change in the society and not be top-down, centralized, one-party movement? 
Uh, shall I take one at a time? Or you, it's up to you. You're chair in this meeting. Yeah. <laughs> well, why don't we collect a few questions and then uh, you can answer them. And thank you. Are there any other questions? <laughs> I have a question, David. Um, I have a question. Um, part of the implication that the revolution was a calculated choice and the way it was gone about was a consequence of calculated choices on the part of Fidel Castro and others. Um, there are potentially serious normative implications um, that come along with this um, regarding uh, accountability for the actions and methods of bringing this revolution about and perpetuating uh, the power relations uh, that, that were consequences from it. And I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Could you elaborate a little more on that? Sure. Um, the idea that the revolution was inevitable and it was just gonna happen one way or another I think in the eyes of some relieves the Castro regime uh, from personal responsibility for the actions they carried out. Um, and that's what, I'm, what I'd like to get at and hear what you have to say about that and how your model might offer a different view. Yeah? Um, what, what if the U.S had not and done what, what if the U.S. had not done what we did? The invasion, Bay of Pigs, uh, the other attempts to ruin and uh, you know, crush uh, the movement, uh, if you can imagine that, um, would you see the evolution in Cuba itself as having been very different? Well, I think that's a good question. Uh, absolutely, uh, Eric. The, the the Soviet model was at its peak of attractiveness, and um, and the issue of Guatemala was very much in the conscience, particularly Che Guevara, who had participated in the events in Guatemala. Um, one thing I will say is that disintegration was not in the cards, um, given the nature of Cuban society and given the unbelievable political strength of Fidel Castro himself. With him in the picture, I don't think disintegration was in the map. A split in the ruling group, yes, that's possible, but very far from disintegration. You know, uh, it is not uh, revolutionary Russia on the aftermath of the Civil War. We're not talking the the struggle against Batista uh, was nowhere near, nowhere near as destructive as the government for years after has claimed. For example, the figure of 20,000 dead is a gross exaggeration, gross. The several thousand were killed, but nothing even approaching that. The economic structure, there were some sabotage and so on, but the, the economy was essentially, the physical plant of the economy was essentially untouched for all intents and purposes. So this integration was not the issue. Now, uh, there is no doubt that the, the prestige of the Soviet model uh, was very important, the Guatemala was important, and as a matter of fact, uh, within the last two years, the magazine Temas, T-E-M-A-S, which is probably the single most important academic and intellectual journal in Cuba, uh, had a, a, a symposium <coughs> on the significance of the 26th of July, and, uh, in 53, and this issue was discussed there. That is, said, what would have happened had we won in 53? And pretty much everybody agreed that it couldn't have gone the way it did for enough for because number one, the the destruction of the the, the 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 collapse of the traditional Cuban political parties was only beginning to happen. So they would have found the traditional Cuban political parties far stronger than they were in 59, far far stronger. But also they mentioned what you brought up: the Soviet Union was not in 53. Stalin had just died, and so on, where he was in 59 with the Sputniks, et cetera, et cetera. So no question is that. Now, uh, the, the issue you're raising about uh, was it the only choice, I think, is related to his question. And that is, uh, I think there is a problem of the, the problem that I am struggling with with the book I'm writing now, and that is the 
standing outside of historical process and making judgments about what would happen or not happen, rather than be part of historical process and trying to achieve what is best for the people. And then they may be defeated. But one thing is for the people taking over and being defeated. Another thing is to preempt that possibility by excluding that option. And I think that's a critical distinction. And I, and I believe that that I believe that the left in this country, certainly, which is the one I'm most familiar with, has been undermined by models of uh, development. I think, for example, Isaac Deutscher is a, is a big culprit in this, because Isaac Deutscher, to me, is the classic case of the person standing outside a historical process and seeing the prices of Stalin and Stalin with, of course, a great price, which he did not pay. Other people do. It's very, very convenient to do that. Oh, Garcia Marquez saying, uh, Many years later, in 1980, he told the New York Times, and said, I, I find that uh, shameful, actually, what Garcia Marquez did. He said, well, I couldn't, you know, he's a big supporter, he's a friend of Fidel Castro. I couldn't live in Cuba myself because I, I, I depend on the information from newspapers. So Garcia Marquez, it's not for me, but I support it for others. No, I'm not suggesting that's what you're saying, but the point is it has ramifications that are very, very deep. So indeed, it may have been defeated. But at least retrospectively, I think that people have a right to try to emancipate themselves and perhaps to defeat it in, 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 in the process. And I believe that addresses, at least indirectly, the issue uh, of responsibility. Now, to take uh, the issue of the US that you raised. Another side that I didn't discuss here, but I have discussed it in my last book, the other side of the problem with the sheer cycling and I, you know, I take Shear Zeitlin because there are well-known people, and, you know, Marie Zeitlin is deserving of so, uh, a well-known Marxist sociologist and so on. He was on. here. He was here. Yeah, I know. I did that. Right. That's from here, he went to UCLA. Uh, in fact... He went to UCLA. Yeah. In fact, as a matter of fact, he came to UCLA, he lived after I failed to get tenure there, so he got his same office I had. <laughs> 251 Hayes Hall. You know, and, uh, I left, the chair was warm from my butt. <laughs> when he sat on it. Um, anyway, um, the thing that uh, the other side of that coin, which is equally problematic, is not only one side I mentioned before was the question of these people are just uh, reacting and they don't have ideas and, and they, they don't have a vision of a good society. I'm not talking here about evil people who are cynics or something like that. They believe in ideas that I don't share at all, that I oppose, in fact. But Raul Castro and Che and people that had a vision of the good society and they were pursuing it, which wasn't mine, obviously. Um, but the, the other side, the other problematic side of that coin of the shares lighting analysis is the implicit assumption that the United States could have done something different. And that, I think, that's implied. No, actually, it's more than implied. You know, they're actually saying that the United States could have should have acted differently. But the question is, the actions in Cuba were of a piece with their actions in the rest of Latin America. There was nothing that they did in Cuba that was in any way different, more or less, or anything that they were doing in the rest of Latin America. And let's face it, that the first step, the first step, the first major step, I should say, of the conflict between the U.S. and Cuba was after the agrarian reform law was approved, where they insisted in immediate cash compensation. Which, of course, the Cuban economy was in no condition to do, even assuming that they would have wanted to do it. So that was, that, that was the key issue. And, and uh, William Bonsal, who was the then US ambassador to Cuba, who was a very interesting guy, by the way, because uh, uh, interesting enough, he had been in Bolivia he had been representing the U.S. in Bolivia, and then he was sent to Cuba. Now you have another revolution trying to replicate in Cuba what you just managed to achieve in Bolivia. And he wrote a book, which I recommend, by the way, uh, Bonsal. Uh, and Bonsal insisted. And he was, by the way, he was a moderate compared to the State Department and, and the Treasury Department, etc., etc. And he insisted, nonetheless, an immediate payment just as the 1940 Constitution had insisted. That was the first major clash. So I don't think there was a, an alternative policy uh, given the, the 
the approach that the U.S. took to Latin America and continues to take to Latin America. I believe that's so far what we have here. Taiwan. I have a question regarding the last part of your uh, talk. Are you talking about this split uh, uh, re recurring in among uh, 12 world revolutions, you said. But you uh, you define that other part. I mean, uh, Cuba took the Soviet form. Uh, uh, they embraced the Soviet form and they equated the part of the state and they uh, like the same thing. I have a question regarding what would the other alternative would be? I mean, what's the other part of the I mean, we can have an idea by looking at the other revolutions around the world, but I mean, what's your take on this? Uh, and yeah. my second question is that how do you define the, I mean, how do you Cuba define Cuba, Cuba's role in the aftermath of the revolution in terms of spreading the revolution because I mean the biggest uh, the biggest shortcoming of Sovietic model is the bureaucratic apparatus uh, intentionally uh, hinders the spread of the revolution in order to preserve its own position that's exactly what happened after the second world war according to my opinion but how uh, how how do you define Cuba's role in terms of spreading the revolution? Because Bolivia was there and... Uh, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. When you ask what is the alternative, uh, there is a distinction to be made. What is my alternative and what is the alternative that was in, in, the, in the actual situation in Cuba at that point? I am a revolutionary democratic socialist. I believe in socialism below. That's my alternative. The question is, was that a significant tendency in 259? No, it was not. However, the question, given the fact that it was not at that time a tendency in Cuba, the question is, was there a, uh, a how should I put it, was there a temporary situation in Cuba where the proper conditions for the growth of such a tendency would occur. And what I would claim, and I would insist to this day, is that the maintenance of union autonomy, the maintenance of the autonomy of black organizations, the maintenance of the autonomy of women's organization was essential to keep the room, the space, for the potential emergence of the, the kind of alternative I would like. I'm not saying that it would have inevitably developed. I'm not saying that because I don't know. But the point is that, uh, that is the creation of spaces where such alternatives may have room to develop. That's the only thing I can say. Concretely, in the case of Cuba, the tendency that would have been most open to that possibility was what I call the left-wing nationalist non-communist choice, the, the, the very people who were proposing making the 26th of July uh, into a democratic rank and file organization. That was not a, uh, a revolutionary socialist tendency. That doesn't mean it was hostile to revolution socialism. It was not that. It was a left nationalist, such as existed in Bolivia as well. And they too were smashed by the middle class elements in Bolivia. Uh, but, but, you know, that's a story. So uh, that's all I can say. Uh, because I, I don't want to stand here or sit here and say, uh, oh, well, you know, what I am favor, you know, uh, that's nonsense. But what I can look back and say, what are the kind of conditions that may have encouraged them? That's all I can say. Um, now, as far as spreading the revolution is concerned, uh, that is the topic here. I'm making an announcement for my next book, <laughs> uh, which hopefully, I'm almost finished writing it, and uh, hopefully by the end of the year, and probably by sometime, by the middle or end of, probably the end of 2011, it might be out. Uh, uh, it's called Cuba, since the 1959 revolution, a critical evaluation, and it will be published by Haymarket Press. Um, but I have a chapter in that book uh, on Cuban foreign policy. And, um, and rather than depart, as every single Cubanologist writing about Cuban foreign policy departs from the point of view of the Cold War, from the point of view of the relationship with the U.S., I depart from a different position. I depart looking historically about the foreign policy revolutions was starting with the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, and then use it from the revolutionary point of view. 
if we look at it from that perspective, uh, there are at least two stages in Cuban foreign policy. One stage that goes from 1959 until 1968, okay, which is the support for guerrilla warfare and the open challenge to the United States in the Western Hemisphere. That created tremendous strains, and I mean king size strains with the Soviet Union, that particular policy. Why? The Soviet Union was not against Cuba making trouble elsewhere. But the problem of the Western Hemisphere is it brought the Soviet Union right smack against the United States on the question of spheres of influence. The, that, the Latin America was the American backyard. And remember, in 1962, the whole discussion about Turkey where in the context of the missile crisis, where in fact the United States agreed secretly, don't tell anybody, you know, secretly, okay, we will remove the missiles from Turkey. It was not part of the Polish agreement. That was clearly a balance of power, spheres of influence agreement. But that was the same kind of uh, approach that led the Soviet Union, and in fact, in 1967, 68, they were beginning to cut down on the shipment of oil to Cuba. So in the light of that, Fidel Castro made a significant turnaround. He played down very substantially uh, foreign policy, excuse me, guerrilla support for guerrilla warfare in Latin America, or if it did, was very much at a much lower level. And, and also to adopt a much more balance of power foreign policy that was shown, for example, in Africa. Because why Africa? And it was very clear that Africa, and by the way, Cuban activity in Africa was far, far, far more substantial than anything it ever did in Latin America. At one point, there were 50,000 Cuban troops in Angola. And there were, in the early months of 1978, seven, within three months, 17,000 Cuban troops were sent to the Horn of, of Africa. Now, it's very interesting that everybody on the left who supports the Cuban government talks about Angola, which Cuba definitely played a progressive role in the war in Angola. What they don't like to talk about is about the Horn of Africa, because it, uh, which was also not quite at the same level as, uh, as Angola, but it was quite substantial. There, Cuba uh, uh, became an accomplice to the murderous regime uh, of Ethiopian, of the Derge, which included the so indirectly Cuban aid. Cuba, there were no Cuban troops in Eritrea, but there was the Cuban troops in, in, in Somalia and Cuban troops elsewhere allowed the Ethiopians to divert those troops into Eritrea and try to smash that movement. So the left, the pro-Castro the pro left doesn't like to talk about the Haram of Africa. It doesn't exist. So much so that there is a, a, a scandalous case of a book uh, written by this Italian scholar whose name escapes me now, published by the same press that published me, so if, if they hear me now, they'll kill me, you know. Uh, which is a, queuing, it's a very well-known book, uh, Conflicting Missions, it's called. And the book stops on a dime on 1977. It's about Cuba policy in Africa, and not a word about the harm of Africa. How can a book about Cuban policy in Africa uh, be only stopped in 1977? Because, of course, the intervention in the Horn of Africa was after 1977. So the easy solution for this author, who was then giving all sorts of awards in Cuba, the book was translated into Spanish by the Cuban government, etc., etc., etc. The obvious solution was, I don't write anything about 1977, no problem. And there's virtually, there's not a word about Eritrea, Ethiopia, any of them because that all happened after that time. So, uh, again, there are at least two stages that are, uh, that are uh, involved here. And it, it, the change was, to a great degree, Soviet pressure. Uh, but even during the first stage, the Cuban policy with, regard to, with regards to Mexico was totally conventional. With regard to Spain, Franco Spain, I'm talking about totally conventional. So it was a mixture of uh, realpolitik poli uh, policy in the tradition of the Soviet Union and the guerrillas, uh, voluntary type of, type of approach. But I, I have a whole chapter on, on that issue. <laughs>
So keep it in mind the root concern. Follow up. Um, I think that the comment you made in passing about people should have the right to be defeated, I think is a fantastic point. I mean, really, it's a very interesting idea of what the retrospective perspective on these kinds of events. That, uh, and I presume that the implication of that is they have the right to learn from history. It's not that you have the right to be smashed, just, right. but it's that you can't, that your learning capacity is enhanced if you're made responsible for what happens. Absolutely. Um, in light of that, it seems to me the, the most important kind of implication of the argument is what it means today when we think about potential future revolutionary situations. Whether or not we in the end decide that the Cuban Revolution has really had a choice or not, I mean, you know, if they were given the choice of allowing a defeat or trying the Soviet model, is that a real choice given, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it's not so much we, have, we don't have to belabor that, but I think your idea that the lesson to be learned is that if you rob civil society of autonomous capacities for organization, then you rob the possibility of a deepening democratic mm -hmm. social revolution. And that's the only possible way to have a robust revolution. I agree. And, uh, and that's the lesson for the future. So I mean, in a way, the relevance of your comments are more for, let's say, Venezuela than they are retrospectively for Cuba per se, this would be a, an argument that a key thing to look at as a, as a critic or supporter is how autonomous are the bottom-up bases of mobilization? Can they withstand the manipulation of top-down efforts to control and contain? Uh, do they provide an autonomous basis of pressure for more democratic and participatory forms? Or is that all just smoke and mirrors? Just a, a brief comment on this. You know, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, but I, but history is not over in Cuba yet. And in fact, right. I have another chapter in my new book <laughs> <laughs> dealing with the uh, the dissidents. And here you have the clock being run over, uh, run through again. Because it's the same goes, the, run, the clock is yeah. running again. Because what is striking about the dissidents, with one important exception, which is the uh, the Christian Democrat of Aldabaya, who has taken tremendous trouble to spell out everything that he stands for. Uh, and it's pretty awful what it stands for. That's another story, you know, but he, I, he, he cannot be accused of, of hiding it because he has laid it out into believable, excruciating detail. But the tendency is running the, the, the Fidel Castro clock all over again, that is non-disclosure and therefore manipulation. So Cuban history is not over. And, uh, and particularly not now when a lot of things are opening up that we we, um, I'm, I'm, you know, and the direction of which is uncertain at this point. But I, I agree with the fun fundamental point that you're, you're making. I think we have a couple questions in the back there. Joao, can you have a question? Yeah. Uh, I would like to expand a little bit on how Fidel Castro came to be the strong man of the revolution. And I would like to. Uh, to have a development in the sense of what he, pre he represented as a leader in the class dynamics of Cuba in that period. Because I'm, I'd like to understand, and given the importance in your, in your account, of his personal agenda, what life experience, material interest, led him, led him to get that agenda that was different from the other tendencies of the revolutionary in Cuba. But also his own personal experience outside Cuba, uh, for instance, his experience in Mexico, and how that shaped his role. And I would like you <coughs> Based on that, uh, to develop what you mean to, when you say that he had uh, popular prestige or support. Because it's not something that just happened, it's something that is built historically. And what led the Cuban society to develop that kind of leadership uh, based on 
the, the size dynamics or the institutional structure of that particular society or, or the kind of trouble they needed in order to defeat Batista? I think we have another question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Comment rather than a question. Sam, sorry, I, I came late and I'm going to leave early because I've got to pick up my son, so I don't even know if I'll hear your I offend. response. But, um, I mean, in terms of looking back at a big picture historically, uh, I mean, you can have a question debate about whether there were historical alternatives. But there's also the question about honest analysis from those of us on the outside who are looking in. I think well, it's been a big, big problem for the, the US left that they have, instead of providing that analysis, uh, engaged in a lot of apologetics. I mean, you can say there was no alternative, but you don't have to paint it in in pretty colors and say that this is this is the, the socialist revolution moving forward. And I think that's been a big problem within within the American left because it's led to, you know, even when the Soviet model was discredited and the Chinese model was discredited, the Cuban model has been presented as, as, as offering some kind of positive alternative. And, and just in practical terms, that's a, that's a disaster because people can look to see what's going on in Cuba and they don't, you know, they don't want a society in which there's political repression and one party rule and, um, uh, and you know, all the rest of it. So I think it's very important to get, the, to get the evaluative piece right. Say what happened, maybe there was no alternative, but if, if there wasn't, then unfortunately it didn't lead to the road that we want to that we want to go down. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> there are any other questions? Well, I, I, absolutely. I mean, you know, I totally endorse what was just said. Now, I mean, the thing is that that the, the other element here is that even if it's even if it's no option, and that was inevitable, so to speak. Well, eventually, the resistance to it is also inevitable. And uh, and I remember uh, a person uh, by the name of Peter Sedwick, who was a, a psychologist, and he also and that's where he, the person who communicated the idea that uh, he edited Victor Search, you know Peter Sedwick, and translated him from French. And Peter Sedwick said, you know, the inevitability of resistance is as important as the inevitability of oppression, and I think that's very well put. Now, in terms of the issue of class dynamic, I think this is, raises a very interesting issue where I would first of all start by making a distinction between the class of origin of Fidel Castro and the class he affiliated with. Um, and here is where there is a, a very puzzling to me and uh, at the same time fascinating. And there is a particular strata that has existed in Cuba or existed in Cuba before the Cuban Revolution which is this segment of people who I call classless in the following precise sense. I call them classless because they have, they have no organic ties to any class institutions. Because part of what being in the class is, it seems to me, is that you are tied with the institutions of that class, be they uh, 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 institutions of the ruling class, or be it institutions of the union, of the working class, etc., etc. There is a there was an element in Cuba from which was a very big source of radicalism in Cuba, uh, to which a lot of the uh, youth members of the Orthodox Party, from which was the principal source of recruits for the 26th July movement. These were people that uh, normally people refer lower middle class, working class, but uh, a lot of them were working class, but none of them had any participation in, in class institutions in Cuba. In a country where working class struggle was major. So this is the main resource for the 26th July movement. Fidel Castro, when he arrives to the university, right away becomes associated with the political gangster groups of the university that were very much part of this milieu. So his class of origin, I think, becomes, in my opinion, more important. The question is, what does he do when he arrives at the university? He becomes associated with the UIR. The UIR was Unión Insurreccional Revolucionaria, which was one of the uh, gentlemen of the happy trigger, as they were calling Caballero de Gatello Alegre, as they were calling Cuba. And it was this kind of highly voluntarist, highly uh, uh, romantic in the sense of exciting experience. Okay? 
And the expression on that was that within a couple of years of being in the university, he gets involved with, with the Cayo uh, Confites, which was the attempt to overthrow uh, Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. He becomes in, involved in the events in Bogota, Colombia, after the death of Eliezer Gaitan, the liberal leader. He was an action man. He was an action man, and he himself acknowledged that his political ideas at that time were not developed. He said later they became developed. So that's this, this, this strata, or stratum of the, of the Cuban population that is also exists in other Latin American countries. But, but it was particularly true of the Caribbean that is the source of a lot of these people in a country where the influence of the church was very small, relatively speaking, in a country where the, uh, there was no real oligarchy in the sense that there, there was an upper class, of course, there was a bourgeois class, but not oligarchy in the sense of Argentina or Colombia or countries of that sort with a strong oligarchical uh, upper class. That was not the case in Cuba, in part because of the American influence that weakened the upper class and made him try to imitate their American betters. So for all these reasons, this is a stratum that I try to do my best to try to interpret. And that's a stratum that we have to understand to understand Fidel Castro, not his class of origin. Uh, um, now, popular support, of course, there was a material basis for the popular support. There was, a, even in 59, there was a very powerful redistributive radicalism. I'm talking about uh, rents were cut in half. Um, uh, the government engaged in a very, uh, in 1959, in a very militant left Keynesianism of public works. Because the, the bourgeoisie was giving a fiscal amnesty. You know, people were not paid taxes, you know, way, you know. They said, you have to pay only a certain proportion if you pay your taxes and you'll be forgiving of the past as well. But then the, the, the Cuban treasury was, was full of, of, of pesos, which were equivalent to dollars at the time, by the way, one to one ratio. So a massive program of public works to employ people. So it was absolute, absolutely material reason why people supported him. He was not just a charismatic leader. You know, he speaks well, he does. He was very powerful material reason, including the very reform law. No question about it. So, but the, the question is, in my opinion, to try to understand this, this stratum which becomes his class or his stratum of affiliation, not the, the one of origin. And there I try to do the best I can in these things I have written. And there are other people, you know, that, that also try to do the same thing. I know, for example, Adolfo Gili in Mexico has tried to analyze similar, uh, he's a historian, has tried to ana analyze similar uh, phenomena in other Latin American countries, not just in Cuba. Yeah, we have time for one more question. Um, so can you just comment on what role the, the particular strategy, of the guerrilla strategy that was employed, Poquismo, what, what impact did that have on, on the, st the political strategy that you've described after victory in, in January of 59? Well, the, the issue uh, in the first place, there was uh, in 59, there was an element of, uh, of what I call street internationalism in Cuba. And what I mean by street internationalism was, uh, uh, was for example, uh, attempted invasions of Dominican Republic and, and, and even Panama that were not sanctioned by the government. This is part of this effervescence that was taking place in Cuba. That was put down very quickly. And by the end, by the middle and end of 59, the government was sponsoring the invasion of the Dominican Republic. Because Trujillo in turn was invading Cuba, you know, with, uh, in June of 59. So all of that eventually developed into the support uh, of guerrilla warfare, uh, which in the case of Regis Debray and his book on the, on the Revolution Within the Revolution, which was published as a book by Monthly Review Press in 1967, was in my opinion the, 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 the essence of an elitist conception of what of, the, of what the emancipation is. Because the, the notion of the folk and bridges the break is literally people being liberated by others, not people liberating themselves. So to me, bridges the break is a classic of this perspective from above. It is true that other people who follow the Cuban model did not necessarily agree with it. So when we get to analyze the guerrilla movements in Latin America, we have to be very careful because there are different, uh, different tendencies and strengths. But the tendencies closest to Cuba, 
And there were tendencies that were not at all in the Cuba's control, but the tendencies that were close to Cuba were very much in this, in this disorientation. It's struck me that you don't mention the anarchists. Um, can you say something about what happened with the anarchists? In 59, at least. Well, the, the anarchists were very important in Cuba until the 1920s, and they had a major impact on the Cuban labor movement until the 20s. Uh, the Cuban Communist Party was late, relatively speaking, being founded, it was founded in 1925. And, um, and uh, which is several years after many other communist parties were formed. The communists essentially, uh, including a Trotsky split off, which was also significant, the Cuban labor movement in the late 20s, early 30s, uh, communists and Trotsky in the labor movement essentially displaced the anarchists completely. And the anarchists went into a, f a significant decline. Uh, so by the 50s, the anarchists, the only influence that I recall they're having was in the Hotel Workers Union. The gastro Sindicato Gastronomico, you know, uh, you know, hotels, bars, you know, uh, barmen, you know, they, that, they, in that union they had some influence. Uh, but other than that, essentially they were a spent force in terms of significant influence. And they're still around, and uh, in, the, in, the, in the development of what could be called a new independent left in Cuba, and for those of you who are interested in that, I recommend that you look at the website Havana Times. Because in Havana Times, it's a very, by the way, it's a very uneven place. And it's really a broad left, independent broad left publication in Cuba. Why it's in English, I don't know. But it is fortunately for you, it's in English. And of course, very few people in Cuba have access to the internet. So, it, you know, none of those publications, including Giovanni Sanchez and Generacion Y, that is world famous, in fact, very few people in Cuba can, can read uh, Giovanni Sanchez, much less Havana Times. But there you will find interesting, uh, now and then, articles, and which includes libertarian points of left libertarian points of view. But you see people who have represented the canceled communist tradition, Trotskyism, you know, any number of left tendencies that now and then surface uh, in that web publication called Havana Times. So it's a very interesting publication that I recommend to you in, in terms of the potential promise of progressive development in Cuba. But I say potential because we're still talking about a very small group, unfortunately from my point of view. Do you think that uh, Frank Fernandez, for instance, is yeah. like exaggerating the role of artists? Yeah, he's a, he, you know, he was a, you know, he must be a man in his 80s or 90s probably, you know, and, and he's a, an anarchist historian of Cuban anarchism. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much for coming and thank you very much for coming.